At the same time, Sonya seemed to be in a tight spot as the monster in front of her almost managed to attack her. Seeing Sonya in trouble, Sumerejai was reminded of his sister Ayumu. He immediately rushed to Sonya and blocked the monster's attack, resulting in a wound on his back. Luckily, Hana quickly came to help them punch the monsters away. Seeing her master injured, Hana became worried, but Sumerejai reassured her that it was just a scratch. Sonya also apologized for being careless and causing her master to get hurt because of her. He then patted Sonya's head and said that such wounds were nothing. Sumerejai then urged them to get back up because there were still enemies left to defeat. After a tiring battle, they were treated to a special meal that night, curry rice. Sumerejai told them to eat as much as they wanted, and there were also some side dishes and desserts for them. Of course, this made them very happy, especially Kana, who took a portion meant for 20 people just for herself. Later, Sumerejai set up a presence block while they were sleeping to be on guard in case of any trouble. Kurokiri, sensing that Sumerejai was uneasy, asked him if something was bothering him. He also noticed that Sumerejai seemed different when he was around Hana's sister. According to him, Sumerejai only showed kindness to Sanya, even willing to protect her from getting hurt. Kurokiri suspected that Sumerejai might be in love with Sanya. But Sumerejai immediately and firmly denied it and scolded Kurokiri. Seeing Sumerejai's anger, Kurokiri said he was just trying to lighten the mood. Kurokiri was also a bit worried, even though they were sleeping and couldn't see him at that moment, he feared they might wake up and sense the presence or hear the sound of a creature. And sure enough, at that very moment, they all woke up because something suddenly approached their tent. They all hurried outside and saw Bays with a woman. Sumerejai then asked if the woman was human or not. But the woman immediately asked if they were the ones who had destroyed the forest. Bays appeared frightened and urged his master to leave immediately. But before he could explain why, Bays suddenly vanished. Kurokiri then reassured Sumerejai that Bays was merely hiding in the shadows and that they could still sense his presence. The woman then explained that the Great Boar Forest is a sacred place for the elves. Therefore, hunting and killing wild animals here is a sin equivalent to destroying the forest itself. That's why she was furious and threatened Sumerejai, demanding that he pay with his life. At the same time, the woman attacked Sumerejai, but fortunately, he managed to evade it, feeling puzzled because with such strong defenses, Sumerejai couldn't possibly be human. Meanwhile, Sumerejai worried that if he fought there, it would endanger his team, so he decided to move away to keep them safe. The woman reiterated that destroying the forest is a grave crime. But Sumerejai defended himself, explaining that he only attacked the animals that had appeared out of nowhere and was merely trying to defend himself. However, it seemed the woman wasn't interested in hearing Sumerejai's explanation and continued to attack him. Sumerejai found it difficult to approach her because she kept flying and was surrounded by winds. Kurokiri then advised him to use his appraisal skill to find her weakness. It was revealed that the woman was an ancient elf named Antia and was at level 415. As Kurokiri had suspected, Antia was both a pure and ancient elf. No wonder Bays chose to retreat and avoid fighting her. Kurokiri then encouraged Sumerejai for having found such a powerful opponent. Antia, realizing that Sumerejai had appraised her, was also somewhat confused about how to defeat Antia, who was over 100 levels higher than him and had the second life skill. Frustrated by Sumerejai's disregard, Antia immediately attacked him with several tornadoes, making it difficult for Sumerejai to handle her. Sanya, who witnessed this epic battle, intended to step forward to help her master, but Kana stopped her, saying that they were weaker and would only be a burden to their master if they joined the fight. So they had to trust and wait for their master there. Meanwhile, Sumerejai continued to hold out, waiting for the right moment to attack Antia. But unfortunately, Sumerejai was eventually hit by an attack and fell, injured. Sumerejai grew increasingly frustrated because since arriving in this world, no one had cared about the problems he faced, acting as they pleased. His anger peaked, causing him to unleash both tree magic and dark magic simultaneously. Not only that, he was determined to keep living until he could defeat them all. Antia was amazed to see Sumerejai still able to rise and fight again. She underestimated Sumerejai, who used shadow illusion skills against her, thinking she only needed to slash through them all at once. 
But Antia was wrong, Sumerajai managed to stab Antia from behind, remarking that if it happened, perhaps Antia would win. After defeating Antia, Sumerajai paused and decided not to kill her, even though Antia had resigned herself to her fate. Sumerajai explained that he was confident he had attacked Antia at a vital point, but because she had the second life skill, she survived. Antia never expected to be defeated by a human. She confirmed that she indeed possessed the second life skill, which allowed her to continue living. But if Sumerajai struck her again this time, she would surely die. Antia also acknowledged that it was only natural for the defeated to die eventually. Sumerajai then speculated that Antia must have been in some kind of trouble, which made her act so recklessly. He complained that Antia should have been honest from the start, rather than forcing them to fight. Antia only laughed at Sumerajai's complaint. She then introduced herself to Sumerajai and apologized for stepping on the tiger's tail, referring to herself. They introduced themselves to each other, and it ended with Antia admitting defeat and surrendering. Afterward, Sumerajai brought Antia back to their emergency tent, where Sonya greeted them, looking worried about her master. Seeing Sonya so enthusiastic and emotional, Antia asked what they planned to do with her now. Would they kill her as mercilessly as they had killed the animals in the forest? Everyone was confused and unsure about the current situation. Fortunately, Baze reappeared and tried to explain what had happened when he investigated the Great Boar Forest. Sumerajai questioned why the monsters were rampaging and leaving the forest. He suspected the Antia people but Antia defended herself, questioning why she would bother coming to the human world to hunt if her people were responsible. Baze explained there were no signs of monsters being driven out of the forest, but he could sense a slight demonic presence. Antia confirmed that some monsters could indeed be controlled by demons. Baze protested, saying he should have informed his master earlier, but Antia had suddenly appeared and wanted to attack. Antia then stated that no one would believe humans were working with the spirits of death, and of course, people would be suspicious of them. With the misunderstanding resolved, Antia invited them to the elf village. Upon arrival, they were amazed by the beautiful scenery of the elf village. However, they found it odd that one of Antia's followers served her in a peculiar manner, lying down while doing so. Antia instructed her servant to prepare food and rooms for Sumerajai's group. She was greeted by the small elves, who asked if she had defeated the evil people outside. Antia reassured them, saying they need not worry anymore as she had ensured the monsters would not come to their village. Antia then shared her curiosity about how long it had been since humans or beast folk had arrived there. She explained that the elves generally dislike being disturbed and prefer a peaceful life, avoiding interaction with other races. However, if the demons were up to something, she couldn't just stand by. She felt it wasn't just the elves but also humans and beast folk who would act similarly. To others, this might seem excessive. However, even if only one demon did something wrong and their race attacked cities, humans, or beast folk, this wouldn't be a problem easily resolved. Antia continued, narrating a legend from the time of the gods thousands of years ago. It spoke of a war between four allies, elves, humans, dwarfs, and beast folk, against two allies, demons and giants. This conflict was known as the God War. After centuries of battle, the four allies won, leaving one of the three continents in ruins and affecting all six races. The defeated giants and demons retreated to the eastern continent. Afterward, the four allies aimed to protect their territories, while the two other allies sought fertile lands and continued fighting until the present day. Antia went on to say that the four allies coexisted peacefully for centuries, but now there are suspicious movements among the humans, one of the four allies. Humans were developing weapons, enhancing magic, increasing their population, and more. Although she didn't know their true intentions, if they were planning to incite a war among the four allies, this peace would be shattered. Furthermore, the two allies might take this opportunity to expand their influence on this continent. So, if the demonic movement was a sign of impending trouble, they couldn't let another war like the past happen. As Antia rambled on, she suddenly realized that Sumerajai's team had been silent, and indeed, they had all fallen asleep listening to her story. After waking up, Sumerajai sat outside, pondering the essence of Antia's tale. He felt it had nothing to do with him. Kana, who had also awoken, joined her master and asked if something was bothering him. 
Kana expressed surprise at Antia's interesting experiences and suggested returning to Algeria if Sumerajai preferred. However, Sumerajai declined, unwilling to cooperate with Antia. Kana then revealed she knew Sumerajai wasn't from this world, having heard that when the demon king appears, a hero is summoned to defeat him. The unnamed hero's name was the same as her master's, so she guessed her master was the hero summoned from another world. Knowing his origin was out, Sumerajai shared that he wasn't a hero, as he hadn't been acknowledged as one. He explained that he was suddenly summoned to an unfamiliar world and abandoned in the vast boar forest, because they didn't need a cook who couldn't fight. Kana was shocked by her master's harsh experience. Sumerajai recounted that Kana likely hadn't been told more. He lived in a hellish environment, unable to wield a sword, relying solely on magic. Constantly fearful of monster gazes, he endured wounds, bites, and attacks until he managed to survive and escape the forest. Because of this, he had no intention of saving this world, determined instead to seek revenge on those who had caused him such suffering. Kana reassured Sumerajai that he had saved many lives, including hers, Hannah's, Sonia's, and others in Algeria. Although they were from another world, whom Sumerajai resented, Kana cried and vowed not to forgive those who had made Sumerajai suffer like this. Sonia joined in, hugging Kana, and declared she, too, wouldn't forgive her master's enemies. It turned out that as Sumerajai recounted his story, everyone had been listening in. Like the others, Hannah wanted to join Sumerajai and wouldn't forgive those her master despised. Even Antia, newly acquainted, chimed in, offering to join them because she, too, was a loner. Behind her jest, she admitted they shared a common goal. She was aware of the summoning story, so she decided to join Sumerajai's team. Moreover, she boasted of her combat skills and extensive knowledge, which would undoubtedly be useful to them. Sumerajai finally agreed to all their requests, though he was a bit worried, especially with Sonia teasing him about having a harem and being popular among women. However, it seemed Antia had her plans regarding the hero summoning, but for now, there was no enemy to defeat. Then, Kana and Sonia were seen happily playing and joking around at the creek to spend time in the elf village. Shortly after, Antia followed and informed them that their meal was ready. They were excited because they were curious about the food from the elf village. However, their hopes seemed dashed when they saw the burnt food the elves had prepared. Next, the young elves gave Antia provisions and advised her to eat plenty to gain enough energy. Antia reassured them, saying she was only going out to explore the human world. She also mentioned that humans have short lives, so she would return in about 100 years, entrusting everything to them. Kurokiri, who heard Antia's words, felt strange because, to Antia, 100 years felt like an hour, despite Kurokiri being an old sword from a long-gone era. Meanwhile, Kana whispered to Sumerajai, saying she and the others couldn't eat insects. Sumerajai understood, even though he had been forced to eat insects while abandoned. But, not having any other options and feeling sorry for his team, Sumerajai made an excuse that he had prepared something for them as a thank you. However, Antia forbade it, saying it was impolite for a guest to do such a thing. Sumerajai insisted Antia see it as a gift from him and brought in a large crab. They were all shocked, thinking it was a monster and wondering where Sumerajai had gotten it. Sumerajai then gave them a cooking demonstration, cutting up the crab. In no time, the live crab turned into a delicious dish. Sumerajai's cooking skills mesmerized everyone in the elf village, and he received praise for his talent. Sumerajai also offered criticism and advice to Antia, noting that the elves' cooking was overdone, making the food tough and burnt. It would be better to cook it to medium rare. During the meal, Hannah asked about her master's plans after leaving the elf village, as they had heard Sumerajai's story earlier. They discussed that the hero summoning nation was in the Raid Cruide Empire, a human realm, far south from their current location. So, Antia asked if Sumerajai had considered his transportation and route. Moreover, they couldn't go straight to the beast folk because the two countries were separated, forcing them to take a detour from the empire if they insisted on going. Besides, the sea route wasn't a good idea either. They suggested it would be safer to head south from Templeton. Kana concluded that Sumerajai didn't know the geography of this world, leaving them wondering how he managed to get out of the boar forest since he didn't know the route. Kurokiri chimed in, 
saying Sumerajai kept going in the wrong direction until he pointed him in the right way to get out. Faced with the women's questions, Sumerajai could only stay silent and feel embarrassed as they were all right. Then, Antia tried to mediate by providing a map of the continent. She explained that the continent is divided by the Great Boar Forest in the north, home to the elves, while the human realm is in the south. The middle region is split into three parts, inhabited by beast folk and dwarves. Antia also showed where the elf village and Algria, the girl's hometown, are located. Additionally, there's the Templeton Kingdom, home to the beast folk, and the rude Cruide Empire, a human nation. Sumerajai pondered how to easily travel to the Raid Cruide Kingdom. Hannah suggested they could pass through the Templeton Kingdom and enter the Engel Federation. Thus, the best way was to leave from the Luke Sandale Kingdom. Hearing that name, Sumerajai instantly recalled the auction won by Echinos, who took him as a hero. Hannah added that the Templeton Kingdom is a place where beast folk and humans coexist, maintaining diplomatic relations with the human realm, which should make things easier. However, being a beast folk herself, she didn't know much about the human realm. Sumerajai asked Kana's opinion, and Kana didn't mind because she had been to the Engel Federation several times. Hearing Kana's view, Sumerajai decided to follow their suggested route and urged them to get ready. At the same time, both Sumerajai and Antia sensed a looming danger approaching them. True enough, an elf guard reported trouble outside. They all rushed out to see something plummeting from the sky at high speed like a meteor. Kana stepped forward to destroy it with her magic. Antia offered to help by combining her wind with Kana's fire. They merged their powers and attacked simultaneously, managing to reduce its size. However, they hadn't completely destroyed it, and it crashed far away from them. Sumerajai shielded his team from the debris caused by the impact. They were shocked to discover that the object was a mountain and were relieved it hadn't fallen on the village, as it would have crushed and destroyed it. Antia was furious because it had damaged the great forest, vowing not to forgive whoever was responsible. It turned out the creature was Krafton the ancient giant. Krafton immediately greeted Antia and remarked that it had been a long time since they last met. He teased her, saying she was still so small that he could barely see her. Annoyed, Antia asked if Krafton had come just to get a beating from her. But Krafton continued to mock her, suggesting that Antia was the one who begged for help because she couldn't handle a one-on-one -on -one fight. Meanwhile, Sumerajai observed that Krafton was at a higher level than Antia, seemingly a barbaric type who enjoys direct attacks and destroying everything. He worried that the village would be devastated if this giant started a fight. Antia became more convinced that the monsters appearing recently were Krafton's doing. She then asked him about his current intentions. Krafton grinned slyly and claimed he had no idea what Antia was talking about. He had come out of curiosity about Antia's disappearance and wanted to check on her. Moreover, he guessed that Antia had lost her second life, so he intended to see her face one last time. At the same moment, Sumerajai flew towards him and sliced off a few of the giant's fingers. Sumerajai then asked Antia if she would mind if he took care of Krafton. Krafton asked who he was, and Sumerajai revealed that he was the one responsible for Antia losing her second life. He added that he despised strong people who bullied the weak without any clear reason. Sumerajai continued to provoke Krafton and invited him to a fight. As expected, Krafton became furious at being underestimated by Sumerajai. Sumerajai intentionally lured Krafton away from the village to prevent the elves and his team from being caught up in the battle. Antia then instructed the children and non-combatants to return to the village while the strong one stayed with her to protect it from potential monster attacks. Meanwhile, Sumerajai, now battling Krafton, was still struggling and trying to dodge. Despite Kurokiri's urging to attack immediately and use his power, Sumerajai's assaults hadn't yet managed to hurt Krafton. He continued his attacks until he finally found an opening to use his skill. At the right moment, Sumerajai unleashed his strong hellfire slash, which Krafton countered with Buchika Mashi. The impact of their clash was tremendous, causing a massive explosion. The girls waiting below for their master were worried, hoping he was safe. Sumerajai was puzzled as Krafton appeared unharmed despite being hit by his strong hellfire clash. At the same time, Krafton complimented Sumerajai for forcing him to use Buchikamashi for the first time. He reintroduced himself as Krafton, the founder and leader of giants and demons. 
Now, Sumerajai felt a bit scared, especially since Kurokiri was experiencing numbness from the earlier attack. Crafton's appearance also changed, and his previous wounds healed. Crafton asked once again who Sumerajai was, curious about how a human could possess such power. He speculated that another human race might have an ancient specimen since, in his view, the human race hadn't died out long ago. Sumerajai admitted he knew nothing about that because he was just an ordinary person. Crafton, now extremely enthusiastic, intended to kill Sumerajai, praising him for making the fight serious. He then attacked Sumerajai with his fist, the impact so powerful that Sumerajai was severely injured. Will Sumerajai be able to defeat the ancient giant, Crafton?